Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. And today I'm delighted to be here with Anne Armbrecht. I've been a huge fan of Anne's herbal contribution over the years, especially in regards to her research and travels to investigate what it means to source herbs sustainably. Anne Armbrecht is the director of the Sustainable Herbs Program under the auspices of the American Botanical Council. She is also a writer and anthropologist whose work explores the relationship between humans and the earth, most recently through her work with plants and plant medicine. She is the co-producer of the video documentary, Newman, The Nature of Plants, and the author of the award-winning ethnographic book memoir, Thin Places, A Pilgrimage Home, based on her research in Nepal. She was a 2017 Fulbright Nehru scholar documenting the supply chain of medicinal plants in India. Her most recent book, The Business of Botanicals, explores the complexities and stories of the global herbal supply chain. She lives with her family in central Vermont. Welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, Anne. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm a big fan of yours. It's great to be here. Ah. <laughs> Yay. Well, I always enjoy talking with you. And, you know, it's been years now that you've been working in this realm. And, um, and I've, it's been fun to see fun, and I would say enlightening every step of the way to see what you come up with. So, and you have an extensive academic background, you received your PhD from Harvard in 1995, and then somehow ended up in the herbal world. So could you share a bit about how you fell in love with herbalism and the plants? Sure. Well, I had just returned from about two years in northeastern Nepal, where I fell in love with rural Nepal and 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 mostly that sense of connection with the land and the plants, not plants specifically, but the earth as something alive with which, you know, I could have a relationship. And I spent a lot of time studying the stories of the priests and shamans and their journeys across the landscape. And and so that was kind of deep inside me. And then I came back to the US and I was writing a dissertation at Harvard, which has little of that aliveness or sense of the aliveness of any world. It was quite a rigorous intellectual program. And around that time I met Deb Sewell at, at a Good Life Center retreat for Helen and Scott mm -hmm. Nearing. They had just passed away and she was there. And I was intrigued by how she talked about the plants and how she moved through the world and I wanted to know more. And so she suggested I go to the Northeast Women's Conference, which I did and met Rosemary. And I immediately signed up for the, the year long apprentice course and kind of jumped in with both feet. Um, I had, when I started, it was, I was in Vermont, we were moving to New Hampshire and I would travel an hour to Sage Mountain and it was the first times I was away from my daughter, who was like a year old at the time. And I would sit in my tent, kind of pumping breast milk, <laughs> and go and learn about, you know, it was learning about herbs and how to heal. But it was also the, the container that Rosemary creates at Sage Mountain as a way to connect with that same sort of aliveness and sense of the sacred, being in relationship with the earth rather than just extracting resources. A lot of what I found so that res resonated with me so much in Nepal. Hmm. I love that. Yeah. And Rosemary, it's not just what she teaches, right? But her presence. And like you said, the container that she creates that is so compelling. And obviously you felt that because you were all in from the get go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as a new mother, yeah. like so many herbalists now, you see sort of a chance to take care to create things, grow things, harvest plants that you can then care for your child with. It's incredibly empowering. Yes, absolutely. Well, for our herb focus today, we're going to be talking about one of my all time favorite plants, which is chamomile. And we're going to be approaching this in a little bit different way because Anne's going to specifically share information about how chamomile is sourced from overseas. So I guess my first question for you, Anne, is does a lot of chamomile used in the US come from other countries? So I wanna just back up before jumping into chamomile and say a little bit how I came to looking at where the plants are from after Sage Mountain, because the other gift I think of Rosemary is how she kind of plants a seed in each of her students of our own relationship with the plants. 
and she kind of nourishes that and then we follow our own journey and I think that's brought in this incredible creativity that you see in the herb world. Anyway, so that's brought in this incredible creativity in the herb world. And so at first I thought I wanted to study to be an herbal practitioner and quickly discovered that I wasn't, that was not what I was set out. You know, I wasn't set up to do that. I just couldn't pay attention to the anatomy and physiology in the right way. And I was drawn to, so then we produced Newman, which was really to celebrate the whole kind of philosophy of herbal medicine, not just this for that herb, herbal stuff, but really getting to the deeper, the heart of it. And I called it Newman because that's that animating force in plants and nature, you know, and all things living. And then that led me to, to looking at the industry because I wanted to know, can that animating force, that aliveness of the world be present? Is it present in herbs that are bought and sold on a global market? And if so, what do I look for? How would I find it? What kind of questions do I ask? So if that kind of is a big question, the thing that's super, super challenging about this work is it's really hard to find out where herbs are from. There's no one place to go and see where's all the chamomile from. And when Joseph Brinkman, who is has probably done more around sustainability and sourcing than most anybody else. He's worked at traditional medicinals for years. I would ask him like one single question. I thought it was very simple. He would talk for an hour about the why there was no simple answer. Or I would ask a, a question about numbers and he would send me this long paragraph with all of the, well, this is, you know, the harmonizing codes and all this, why it's impossible to really say how much chamomile is in the US and how much is overseas. He would produce these market reports that he was paid for quite generously, I think as a consultant, it would take him three to five days of full-time work on one plant. And partly that's wow. because there's this history of a lack of transparency in the botanical industry, um, you know, which has a whole bunch of reasons for that. Probably, you know, in my book, I kind of rooted back in the early days of transnational trade but I'm not avoiding your question about chamomile. Um, <laughs> to, well, but what to, comes up for me and to hear all that is that um, there's, there's like this whole hidden world going on in the botanical industry that a lot of us grassroots herbalists don't necessarily know about, you know, whether we harvest the herbs from around where we live, or even if we order them dried, from an herbal apothecary or even from a local herbal farm. You know, it's sometimes it's like they show up on our doorstep and we don't necessarily know the story behind those. And that's one thing I really loved about Business of Botanicals, your book, is you brought so many stories to life in such a compelling way. I had a tough time putting down the book and I was often, you know, you know, didn't want to set it down. And then I also had my highlighter in hand and I just love the way you put so many things. So, and I, I and I appreciate that there is no simplicity and there's a lot of complexity um, in regards to this too. So I'm looking forward to, to ex you know, hearing all of that, like not just the easy answers, but the complexity behind it, because that's very insightful as well. Well, thank you. So to, to try and prepare for talking about chamomile. I Joseph Brinkman sent me this mm -hmm. whole file, his country file of reports. And it's like over a hundred reports probably of focus country species specific or country specific reports on medicinal and aromatic plants from that region and these reports to try and boost the trade. And um, I didn't get very far on that because it's really boring to read. But then I also spoke with some people who work at Organic Herb Trading Company, which is a trading company in the UK, who really, in my mind, I talk about them some in the book, but in my mind, they really embody the kind of herbs that I, as a person who really cares about quality and who defines quality, not just as a constituents in that plant, but the quality of life of all the people involved along the way and the environment. You know, herbalists talk a lot about the constituents in the plants and how this, you know, chamomile will help you sleep or the end product. 
And it's all about wellness. But what I'm trying to do in all the work I do with the book and the Sustainable Herbs Program is really say, we can't be well until that whole process from source to finished product is well. And so when I was talking to them about chamomile, they get their chamomile from Egypt. So the big sources are Egypt, India, Eastern Europe, and then what's grown in the US, you know, sort of Zachwood's farm or Oshala herb farm, or, you know, a lot of the um, probably foster farm botanicals, that kind of domestically grown botanical um, chamomile. And then Egypt, there's Eastern Europe. We have been doing a series of webinars for the Sustainable Herbs Program. And I interviewed, one of the speakers was a woman from a family owned company in Croatia. And their biggest product is chamomile. And it's UEBT certified, which means Union for Ethical Bio Trade. And what that means is it has to be certified organic and they have these plans for biodiversity to really, how are they increasing the biodiversity in the area? But what really struck me from that conversation with her was the importance of a company that's a family business. Her parents started it. She and her generation now run it. They, they, they're from that region. So they care about the quality and the inputs, the chemicals, how the, the work employees are cared for because it's the region they're from. And so there's this closed circle in a way. Right, so they see the impacts and so they're gonna take a better care. Whereas a lot of the herbs, and so now I'll get to the Egypt part, they're sourced from Egypt. Uh, a lot of the, when I asked them about the challenges, they're like, there's so many challenges. But in, in Egypt, the, the, the water, the Nile is quite polluted. And there's also huge acres that are in conventional farming. And so irrigated, even if it's certified organic, it can be, get pesticide residue from the irrigation or also they described walking mm -hmm. into a farmer's organic fields but to get there you walk along this um, tributary that's surrounded by conventional farms and so what they're trying to do mm -hmm. is move a, to a different region and and they're trying to build the soil in more desert region that can have separate source of water so that the water isn't gonna be polluted, which means digging boreholes, and that it's not as exposed to pesticide drift. So that's one of the challenges is finding mm -hmm. land that's not polluted. Um, another challenge they were talking about is there's certified organic chamomile coming from Egypt, Egypt but there's not a real context for supporting rigorous organic practices. So it's more like organic checking the boxes and not seeing that organic means building the soil or fair trade checking the boxes, not really answering questions about pre-financing, you know, the things that make it a fair deal, pre-financing, better pay, um, long-term commitments, you know, all the things that anybody hopes to have to have sort of a better livelihood. So, so what they're doing is they have spent a lot of time going back and forth to Egypt to develop these relationships with farmers and give them training and pro provide them support and develop that over time to get the quality that can pass, you know, the, the rigorous quality control things on the end, but that also kind of support what I think, you know, that small grassroots model, right, of really supporting rural livelihoods, which I think is what is in the philosophy of herbal medicine, but often the herbs aren't coming from that route. I, I'll let you ask, because I could keep talking, but. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. And it just, I see the, hearing you talk and also through your book is just the, all these different layers of what it means to be sustainable, all the different layers it takes, again, just to get the herbs to our front door. And that's something, you know, you think about like even how much herbs cost. It's amazing to me that like, you know, I could buy a pound of dried chamomile flowers that has been sourced from overseas. And until the work that you've been doing, I haven't even begun to realize the work that goes in 
to bring, you know, it's just so easy. It just shows up on my doorstep, but there's so much that goes into it. You're talking about years of relationship building. You're talking about um, all of these different certifications or just mentalities to make sure that the people are treated well, the soils are treated well, the plants are treated well. We haven't even talked yet about like processing or shipping or anything about that, but it, it is pretty amazing what goes into bringing these plants to us. Yeah, yeah. And that's what one thing I was learning and one thing I feel like the, what I'm trying to do on my work that's directed more at the herb student, herb community is I was so naive about the questions to ask and what things mattered and what mattered less. And I feel like a lot of what the book is about is really trying to shed my naivete a little bit, like understand through the eyes of the people who are grappling with, yes, ideally you dry the herbs this way, but in this village, this is what they're doing. Okay, so how do I work with that? What are the differences? Is it putting them in clean sacks? Is that the thing that is most important? You know, sort of prioritizing and seeing it, yeah, in that nuance and figuring out how to navigate that and what steps can make a difference. Yeah, I think, you know, for most grassroots herbalists, if you said like, okay, I have, I have two different chamomile batches of chamomile for you. And, and this chamomile was grown in polluted poor soils, was watered with polluted water. Uh, people weren't given a living wage to harvest it. And there weren't precautions taken along the way to ensure the quality, et cetera. And it, you describe that and then you say, in this other batch of chamomile, there were certifications and um, I don't want to word just the word certification, but kind of like you talked about a family business ensuring um, that their workers and people involved were paid well, that the soils were built up, that there wasn't polluted water being used, et cetera. I mean, it'd be like a no brainer choice, obviously, right? Like you're going to, you're going to want the good stuff and it's probably going to be apparent not only because of the stories, but I'm guessing uh, that the way the chamomile looks and smells and then acts, you know, in our body when we work with it is also going to be different. But what has happened, I think, is a lot of times the choices that people see are like a lot of that story is a re re, um, erased in the background. And what we see is cheap chamomile and expensive chamomile. And then the choice, that's where people base their choices on. It, you know, is this the price that I want to pay? And I, yeah, so and that's, that's a hard. Just, it's uh, interesting to, yeah, it is a hard one. It's not necessarily that we want to pay expensive prices that put a burden on us when working with herbs. Absolutely not. But it it is good to hear the story, to hear what goes into this, to know the questions to ask. Uh, that I love that you brought that up because that was such a powerful part of your book. Is is, you know, what are those important questions and how can we shed some of our ideals in face of like, what is reality? But it's it's good to know all of that. And then as a result, work with those herbs and use those herbs really responsibly to cherish and value them and all that went into bringing them to us so that we aren't just amassing pounds of herbs and, and storing them in our basement for years. That's such a good point. You know, I know when I was studying herbal medicine and we were supposed to encouraged to buy a lot and make a lot. And Joseph Brinkman recently spoke on the book club I organized for Business of Botanicals. And he talked about, you know, the need, these are precious things and to treat them with that respect. And Elise Higley from Oshala Herb Farm says, you know, whenever, you know, people complain about the prices of their herbs and then they come out and spend a half a day harvesting and they they don't ask any questions anymore about the price. <laughs> but it, it's, it's a, um, I think it's a real challenge issue that, because there is, herbs are expensive. If you're gonna take a tincture for the time to make a difference and you're buying that tincture, that can be expensive. There's access questions, I think. And, but within the botanical industry, there's such a range in quality and you definitely get what you pay for. And I think another thing around that complexity that I do think is important for the herb community that, to understand that complexity, that it, there is a lot of black and white, like domestic versus is better. And sometimes it's better, but it's not always better because there might be smallholder farmers in Southern India 
whose lives are kind of organized around trading because of the history of colonialism and all of that. So, and it's a way if it's done well, it can provide a good livelihood for those turmeric growers or you know ginger growers or in Eastern Poland, wild harvesting nettles is a way to you know provide that kind of income again if it's done in a way that considers the price and that over harvesting and all of that it's not necessarily that that versus organically grown in the US one it's not that one's better or worse it's that each has different impacts and effects and so i'm just trying to connect those so that we can choose okay what values do i want to support i really want to support small farmers in the us then that's how i'm going to find the herbs to support to purchase you know that that buying our herbs is the world we're creating you know to sort of and to understand what worlds we are creating when we buy them yeah i like that that it's really not a black and white thing it's that it's there's this gray shade in between of and looking to see what's most important to us and i might choose to source herbs differently than the way you source herbs and that doesn't make either of us wrong or right but just following um our values in that way I, so a question i have then i you know i asked like does a lot of chamomile that we use in the U.S. come from overseas? And your answer is, well, that's very complicated. <laughs> um, and you talked about how you asked questions, you know, that were naive. And so I guess I'm wondering, like, if someone wants to source, we can say chamomile, but maybe we can include other herbs in this. What would be some questions to ask? I would. So who, whomever you buy, if you buy bulk herbs, say, from someone who's importing them, it could be domestic or international call them and ask them, where's your chamomile from? Do you have a relationship with the growers? Do you know, do the, tr do the people you buy it from? Because there's so many layers, in fact. And even at a company, a wholesale company in the US, you know, Star West, Mountain Rose, from, they, they might not buy directly with, from those farmers, say in Egypt, but hopefully they've visited them. And then someone else helps handle the logistics because that, that import export can be really with quality control. And you know, that's, can be quite challenging. So ask them what their relationship is. Another thing I just learned to ask if if you if you want to buy domestically grown herbs, ask what percentage is domestic in that lot. In a recent webinar mm -hmm. with domestic herb growers, they said that companies will claim that their herbs are say grown in Hawaii when in fact because the price is so different, then they'll mix them and still claim that it's domestic. So uh, you got to uh, you know sort of ask that another question is are they wild harvested or cultivated? I did this a little bit. I searched for 10 different companies. I found them on Amazon that sold black cohosh and I asked I wrote them emails and I asked if, where it was wild harvested. At like 97% is wild harvested in Appalachia. Two thirds of them said three quarters said it was cultivated. So I wrote back and I said, oh, where is it cultivated? And eventually they stopped answering my questions. But it wasn't cultivated because it's not cultivated. But often it doesn't necessarily have to mean they're lying. It's that the marketing people aren't necessarily, you know, the person answering my questions aren't connected with purchasing. But the more they hear like that we're pulling on this string here and saying just a simple question, do you know where the peppermint is from, echinacea is from, whatever the plant is, where is it from? How are they caring for the soil? What kind of wages are people getting? Or you know, how much are they selling for per pound? Then they think, then companies will know, oh, people are starting to ask questions. There are those specific enough questions. <laughs> yeah, those are great. And that last yeah. one I think is so important. Like one thing I'm pulling from is like relationship is so important. The relationship on all fronts. <laughs> um, and finding out the strength and depth of those relationships is important yes. Uh, yes. to the best of our ability, which makes me think about the plants themselves, right? Those herbalists, like we want to have personal relationships with those plants and not just have them be like, you know, a pill that we swallow three times a day and never give thought about the plant. So it echoes that relationship that we're always looking for. Yeah. And then looking for those answers and not, I mean, it's our, I feel like it's our duty to be asking those questions and pushing the button on that um, even when we're given those quick answers. I had a similar thing happen recently where I asked a company 
that was selling um, lots of chaga in their tea recipes. And so I wrote them and I said, I'm concerned about the sustainable harvest of chaga. Is your, is your chaga harvest sustainably? Well, guess what they answered? Yes. <laughs> like, what are they going to say, right? Like, no, <laughs> it's not. Um, so that was like a really easy answer for them. And so I followed up and I said, um, you know, what steps are you taking to ensure a sustainable harvest? And that, like, I got a really vague response. And so I followed up again and it was kind of the same thing. Like there was not, you know, it was like the easy answer only. And then, but they didn't have specifics. And I think we're, we're in this day and age, we need specifics, right? As we follow that trail. Yeah. And if a company can't give us, you know, those specifics, then I think it's worth finding someone who can. I think so. And that is where certifications come in. You know, certifications aren't perfect, but they're a start because a third party certification like Fair, Fair for Life, Fair Wild, Fair Trade, Organic, which is much, you know, they have to pass these assessments and they are tested. You know, somebody comes to make sure they're checking those boxes, even if it is just checking boxes, it's something. And the more people are asking, I feel like. And I love what you said about the depth of the relationships. And because to me, ultimately, that question I was asking, can intention be found in a global supply chain? And what I came down to, or the answer that I left with was when there is that relationship. And it doesn't have to be that the end person in the US has that connection with that wild harvester in the Northwestern Himalayas, but that someone all along the way is making that connection so that it's not it isn't only a commodity. I mean, I think herbs that are bought and sold on a global supply chain are commodities, but is it possible for them to be something else too? That's what I'm asking. You know, it's like, like I'm trying to make that be possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. So with, with chamomile, I think it'd be interesting for everyone who has bought chamomile to you know do a little homework research and find out, you know, where did that chamomile come from? Or of course, if you're buying it in the future, you know, to look for that, where did the chamomile come from? And it'll be interesting, you know, Anna's told us there's sourcing out of Croatia, sourcing out of Egypt, of course, in the US as well. Uh, but to follow that and, and see where that comes from. And, and as always, with all herbs, you know, to, to try different herbs and also use our organoleptic testing, you know, what does that smell like? What does it look like? How does it feel in my body? And um, that can be another way that we you know, as we develop that relationship, we can associate the relationship with that particular, you know, batch of herbs and knowing where it comes from. So it's not just like, this is my relationship with this chamomile, but knowing the origin of that chamomile, wherever that might be, it could be from your garden too, of course. Exactly. That's, I mean, this whole, then the, the book, when I finished writing the business of botanicals, I realized that the plants, I thought I was following plants, but they really were connecting me to people around the world. And I, and that journey was, the healing part of it, like it brought me into myself and into the world in a way that I never expected herbal medicine could. But that goes back to the point I was trying to make about Rosemary about she plants that seed in each of us. So it, it doesn't have to look the same, you know, again, which is a principle of herbal medicine, it's an individual patient, uh, client, practitioner, or individual relationship with the plant. And each of our journeys is unique if we listen to the plants and follow them. So. Absolutely. Getting back to chamomile, do you like to drink chamomile tea? Is that something that's frequently in your teacup? It's, you know, I don't drink a lot of tea. <laughs> I, I mean, I drink tea that I harvest like nettles oh, no. and peppermint from my house. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, yes, no, I drink nighty night tea mm -hmm. from traditional medicinals. I'm sure it's in there, nighty night tea. Yes, but it I, must be. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. often drink chamomile tea at night as well. Yeah. And I love it as just a companion. It's such a gentle companion, um, but can be super strong medicine if needed as well. Yeah. One of my newest favorite things to do with chamomile, I haven't done this for very long, but is to take the um, freshly dried chamomile from my garden and infuse that into oil and make an infused oil out of it. And that is just lovely. Chamomile, of course, is, modulates inflammation and that smell is so lovely. So I love using that on um, my face and body at night before I crawl into bed. It's a nice bedtime oh, ritual. Does it make that? Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Though. 
And it mark. doesn't. Yeah. So the infused oil is like bright yellow when I do it. Okay. So it kind of takes on that yellow hues, but I do like to put the um, chamomile essential oil into it as well. And that, which is blue. So it'll change it green actually. Cause it's like the blue essential oil with oh, the wow. yellow oil will change yeah. it green. I just put a couple drops in there and kind of boost the scent. but I've done it without too. And it's lovely. So either way is good. When we were in Bulgaria, there was some chamomile fields that we visited and they were using it for essential oil. And he gave us the water, the, I guess it was, is that a hydrosol? I'm not an expert in, but, and so we were using mm -hmm, yeah, that yeah. It was lovely and surprisingly so astringent, but there was yeah, this tiny yeah. factory oh, on the side of this road in the mountains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful aromatic experience. <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, and one of the things I love about herbalism, and we've kind of already talked about this, is that just the many ways that people bring herbalists, you know, bring herbs to life, um, bring herbalism to life. So I'm curious, what projects do you have going on right now? Or what are you working on now in the plant world that you'd like to share with us? Well, my book, um, here, it's my book, <laughs> Business of Botanicals. Um, and so really trying to get that message out into the world and and bring people along on that journey. And then that, so so that book I wrote, because what I'm trying to do is the work at, I do at the Sustainable Herbs Program is really trying to change the system, the botanical industry to make it show that the connection between quality and care of the long-term health of the plants and the ecosystems, that it's all the same thing. But I, the first step to changing that system is really understanding that system and seeing the system. And so that's what the book is about. And then trying to talk about it and spread that word. And then at the Sustainable Herbs Program this last year, we've had a series of conversations with people who are really engaged in trying to do this work, who work for different companies, you know, either finished product brands or ingredient suppliers or, you know, are buying directly from growers around the world and really dig into the issues a little more. And so what does responsible sourcing look like? What are the challenges? How can companies come together to work, to collaborate, to address building healthy soils? Or, you know, like one of the biggest issues in the urban industry is migration to urban areas and there's nobody to do the work. And so conversations about how to support those who do wanna do the work through diversifying income or better pay. Next, in two weeks, we're going down to Costa Rica and Nicaragua to do some filming. So the heart of Sustainable Herbs Program is these short films. And we're looking at a project in Nicaragua where there's coffee growers and someone has been working with them to have them plant turmeric and vanilla and I think cardamom and in an agroforestry setting. So it's providing the coffee growers with another source of income. It's trying to diversify that the farming practices and build the soil, you know, drawing on regenerative farming practices and also sell for a higher wage so that more income comes to them. And, and we're looking at some similar projects like that in Costa Rica. So that's an exciting up and coming. Wow, I look, thing. I look yeah. forward to seeing those films. That'll be great. I yeah. love the films that you've produced already. Always so insightful. And of course, I'm a huge fan of the book. Uh, my readers probably already know that because I promoted it a lot when it came out earlier this year. And I was lucky enough to be an early reader of the book. So I got, you know, the publishing company sent me this like soft cover book that wasn't quite done yet. And I just, again, like I, I picked it up kind of like, uh, like, okay, I got to read the book because, you know, it's an important book. And I literally could not put it down. It was just a page turner, the stories and the travel log and, and seeing this, you know, herbalism in this different light was just so eye-opening for me. And one of my favorite chapters in the book was about the kind of the history of the rebirth of herbalism in the 60s and 70s that happened here in the United States. And that's a really interesting chapter, getting to hear about the origin of a lot of herbalists that we know and love today, like Rosemary Gladstar and David Winston, Ed Smith, Phyllis Light. And Anne has generously offered that excerpt or that chapter excerpt for listeners. So you can head over to the herbs with Rosalie podcast.com. You have the whole show notes there. You'll see ways to connect with Anne through her website, through the sustainable herbs program. And you can also download that uh, chapter of the book as well. And I 
highly recommend reading that chapter, but obviously the whole book is so, so good. And and then Anne graciously sent me a hard cover copy of the book after it was published. And but I can't get rid of either of them because now I have like the beautiful hard copy. And then I have like mine that has like lots of notes in it. So both are going to be cherished copies on my bookshelf and um, something that I'm going to refer to frequently in terms of, you know, what are those questions, the importance of relationship. So I definitely feel that all herbalists need to read this book. It is so important, but it's also a fun read too. Okay. Thank you. I mean, when you said it was readable, I thought I have succeeded if Rosalie found it. Because <laughs> often, yeah, I can get very caught in the details and overwrite things. So I'm honored that you shared that feedback. Um, I'm so grateful that you wrote this book. And it, it wasn't you just like sitting down and writing a book. I mean, you traveled to India a couple times and and um, other places and really had big conversations with, uh, you know, all sorts of people within the supply chain. And yeah, a lot of a lot of work went into that book, and I'm just so grateful that we have that. It's it's in some ways it's hard to imagine now not having it because it's so important for herbalists to know this information, and it was a missing piece of the puzzle for so long. So I'm really grateful that we have the book. Thank you. Well, I have one last question for you today, Anne, and that question is: with all of the challenges that we're facing today, what are some ways that herbs instill hope in you? Oh, it's interesting. You know, I had an answer prepared, but I, I just love the plants. I mean, and I now have this big garden where we, I was looking out at my garden, but, and I just like walking through and seeing who's there um, more than using them in any way. And because, you know, back to those same questions that drew me to herbalism in the first place, because they're, they take me out of my own self and are something to be in relationship with. That's not me. The other thing though that gives me hope or that I believe is a potential is, and this is what I'm exploring in the business of botanicals that, you know, right now, I think to me, the cause of so much that's wrong in the world is our disconnection from the natural world and in turn our disconnection from each other that is using the earth as a resource for our own use. And plants and herbal medicine offers a different way of relating. And you know, this is taught, Robin Kimmermer has talked a lot about this, but I, we all know that from our own relationship with plants also, as well, or anything that we love, right? We have a relationship and we're gonna care for that. And maybe we'll use it, but it's not just a transactional thing. It's that give and take that you were talking about. And so I feel like if, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about watering the seeds of what you wanna bloom, I feel like if we water that, if the herb community can really take the lead and water the seed of that relationship with whatever product, you know, if we buy an herbal product or if we grow it ourselves, but in whatever way works for us to water that seed, that it's not just a transaction, it's some give and take. And, and to me that I'm curious, like, okay, what might we be able to create and what can we show what kind of pathway could the herb, the marriage of the herb industry and herbalism, because right now they're pretty separate. If they were to come together a little more, what pathway might that show for right relationship with the world that we live, you know, the natural world? That's my hope. Hmm. I love that. That was beautiful. That's really what you're talking about is like my big why and why I'm here too. So I really appreciate that, that relationship and reciprocity and, and I, I grew up in a world that was about resource extraction and and using things. And I feel like some some of my most important work internally, as well as sharing with others, is reframing my own mindset and approach to be about relationship and reciprocity rather than than strictly about resource extraction, which in the end is such a more deeply fulfilling and beautiful life to live. So there's lots of rewards with that too. And it can be hard, you know, and so it's sort of I, I like. A, a quotation of Joseph's is like, just start somewhere, you know, it's not easy, but if you're curious, you're not worried about easy. <laughs> Some that things you cool. are going to be extra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Anne. Thanks for being here on the show. Thank you for all of your important work. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me and all of your important work. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And for the listeners, don't forget to head over to herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to download your book excerpt 
and to see ways that you can connect with Anne and all of her important work. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. And before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so that you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. And I'd also love to hear what you thought about this interview, your relationship with sourcing herbs, how you might do things differently in the future, your thoughts on chamomile. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. And I'm so glad that you're here as part of the Herbs with Rosalie community. Have a beautiful day.